for those already here, thank you for joining us. We are, um, each of and every one of us is at home and I hope this is a good uh, entertainment for the evening and I hope you bring some enjoyment for you. We are recording this session. I want to make sure that you are all aware of that. And so I want to thank, first of all, uh, those who came uh, and thank the companies that are helping us bringing this uh, live Bash Lane and MemSQL are partnering with us, uh, providing logistics and organization support so we can keep on doing this and helping the community and making sure we are all together on this, still doing our meetups. We are all missing our uh, join, join meetings and beers and pizzas, but well, this is what we have and let's, let's enjoy it. If you have any question, we ha still have a Slack. It's a little bad nowadays, but you can still join and um, bring some questions on Twitter as well. And if you have any unsplore subjects or any talk that you would like to to give uh, to our community, you are more than welcome. I'm sure you guys are thinking about how preparing new things with these new challenges, uh, not for those who already work remotely, but for the, the ones who just started. And so we're hoping to see new, new insights on this new way of working and how you're dealing with that. And please share with us if you have any difficulties or you need help on your work because we are a community and we are here to help. Today, we're gonna have two speakers. Uh, this um, is reverse. So Mateusz Monte, he works in Amazon Web Services and he's the speaker who will be joining us uh, briefly. And he was going to talk about React code organization, move things around until it looks right. And we have our own helper for the organization, Leonardo Pitelli from OLX, with the B side of the browser. We are going to start with Leo. Oh, since we have Mateus in line. And, but we're going to start with Leo and then we pass on to Mateus. Hi, Mateus. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, do you, can you hear me too? Yeah, we can, we can. Okay. I was just presenting the meetup and I was saying that Leonardo is going to come first as he is already prepared with the share screen and all. And you're going uh, after Leonardo, okay? Okay, no problem. So we have um, a menu here where attendees can join with, for the Q&As. So feel free to put in any questions you have and we will um we will have them after each talk okay and um hello ready yeah i'm ready okay thank you so let me share my screen there we are uh, so yes thank you for for shining it's uh, the end of the work day but I hope you are still awake. Uh, I will try to do this fast as uh, as fast as, as fast as I can, so you don't sleep. Um, a bit about me: I'm Leonardo Pitelli. I'm working at OLX. Uh, I'm here, living in Lisbon since September last year. Uh, I'm Google Developer Expert for Cloud and Web. And if you want to reach me out, uh, probably the best place to do it will be in, in Twitter and you can find me as Leo Pitelli, uh, double T and double L. Uh, I also have the, the same issue. Uh, I'm Argentinian, but my, my grandparents were Italian, so that's why it sounds like Italian. Um, so the, the whole idea of this talk, uh, it's, a, it's an old talk that, that I prepared, I think, more than three years ago. And now I, uh, now I updated it with the latest, latest changes. Uh, I, I linked in the, at the end of the presentation, you, you will see a really nice post where I took uh, a lot of illustrations, you, you will see. But the whole idea of, of this presentation is to understand what happens between the moment we start 
entering an address in the in the address bar of our browser until we actually see the page rendered. Um, I hope any of or no one of you works in this site. Uh, this is a, a fast 3 g emulation uh, connection uh, entering to, to the site. And if any of you work there, I hope that after the this presentation you will have a lot of things to 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 think about and, and probably to optimize. Even though this is not a performance focus uh, talk, we will probably talk about this uh, a lot. Um, so before starting, we need to review a few concepts uh, more related with uh, operating systems and, and that kind of things. Uh, the first one is processes and, and threads. Uh, a process can be described as a, an application executing program. Uh, a thread is the one that lives inside uh, a process and executes any part of, of it. Uh, so a process can have more one or more threads uh, running inside. Uh, any process will have a private space in the memory of our system. Uh, uh, and uh, when the process ends, that, that memory will be free. If any process uh, spin up any other process, there's something that could happen uh, to handle a different part of the application, for example, then that new process will have another different isolated private space of, of memory, and they can communicate uh, with, with the other using IPC or inter-process communication. So how are the browser's uh, architectures? Let's say I, I will talk only about Chrome. There is no standard specification on how a, a web browser should be built. Uh, in, in case of Chrome, we will have a lot of different processes handling different parts of, of the application. Uh, as you can see here, there is a browser process in charge of the tabs and the back and forward buttons and the address bar. Then we will have a render process handling what happens inside a, a specific tab. Then we will have a plugin process. For example, if we are running a, a flash inside a, a, a page, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you probably didn't understand the GIF at the beginning of the presentation, you are very young. Uh, and you are lucky, uh, but uh, uh, the idea is, is, is this one. We have different processes for different parts of the, of the browser. And why the, the Chrome decided to architect um, the, the application like, like this? Well, because if any of the processes uh, gets unresponsive, we can kill that tab. We probably saw this uh, all a snap uh, illustration uh, many times uh, and we can kill that that process that tab without compromising the rest of the of the application um, another benefit of, of having this separation is uh, security and sandboxing as each process has uh, its own uh, private memory space we are sure that we are not mixing things um, and also we can give a, a render process uh, only the accesses, the permissions uh, to the operating system uh, tasks for, for the things that we know that process need uh, and, and we are uh, more safe in, in, in that way. So now, now yes, uh, talking specifically uh, about the, the navigation. Uh, so when, when we start navigating to, to a site, the first thing that, uh, in this case, case uh, Chrome needs to understand is, are we trying to do a search or are we actually enter, entering a, a new URL? As you know, we can search from the address bar, so the browser needs to understand if we want to visit a, a website or we want to do a search. Uh, imagine that, that this is a, a URL, so uh, the, the browser process will ask the, the Actually, the UI thread will ask the network thread to, to visit that, that site, to, to get the, the content from, from that URL. That will trigger a lot of different things like DNS uh, lookup, establish, establishing a, a TCP or a TLS connection, 
uh, even handling redirects because it's something that could happen. In, in that case, the network thread will communicate with the UI thread uh, and ask for, for the redirection. Uh, if, if we see all the things that happens between the, in this case, the start time uh, that we have here and the um, response start, that is the moment when we start receiving uh, the first byte from the from the server. This is what we call time to first byte. It's a metric that is really useful to understand uh, how long the, the users are waiting for to start the, the response. Uh, and as I said, we have a lot of different things happening there. Uh, I will focus mainly on, on the DNS and TCP and the request and response uh, part. Um, so, the first part is we have a, a URL, we need an IP address to establish a TCP connection. Uh, so the browser will look into its own cache. If it has the IP there, we'll use that one. If not, we'll ask the operating system to uh, do the same. The operating system will have its own cache of, of uh, DNS responses. If it's not there, then we will need to go to the IS, ISP or, or the DNS server that we have configured. And if it's not there, then we will go to a recursive search around the internet. Uh, this is done over the UDP protocol, so the packages can get lost or a package cannot get to the destiny and, and the, to the destination. And the browser needs to handle that too, because uh, if not, the, the user will keep waiting forever. So it has an, an internal timeout to start the DNS lookup again in case of not receiving the, the packages that it's needing. So once we have the IP address, we can establish a TCP connection. Uh, typically, the sender will, sit, will send a, a, a SYN package. The, the server, the, the receiver will ask, we will answer with a SYN ACK. Then the sender will ask, answer with a, a, another ACK. Uh, and then we will start sending the application data data and in, in our case could be the the request for the page that we want to visit um, if we need to handle ssl then we have an extra round trip here to inter, uh, to exchange uh, the the cipher di data that we that we need so an example uh, if we want to transfer 64 kilobytes uh, over a new connection as i said we need only talking about a, a TCP connection, uh, we need to do the, the first round trip to establish the, con the, the, the connection, then doing the actual get to the file that we want to, to see or the document. Then the process, the, the, the server will have some time to process the request and, uh, and build the, the response. And then we'll start sending back the, the data that we ask. TCP has a, a, a dynamic window. So the first time that, that we receive a, a response, we, we will have only a part of the response. In this case, it's 14 kilobytes. So we, are, we want to, to get 64. Uh, then we will need to ask for the next segments. Uh, in that moment, TCP will uh, get a, a bigger window because this, this is a, a a mechanism that TCP has to, to avoid congestions all over the, the network. Uh, so in this case, the next uh, package will have the, the double of, of size and we will need a third round trip to get the, 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 the remaining bytes of our file. Uh, so in this case, just to get 64 kilobytes uh, with a new connection, we will need to do four round trips that in this case are more than 250 milliseconds because we are uh, talking about six, uh, 56 milliseconds to do a, a round trip. Uh, and we have to add to this the times for the DNS and the TLS uh, part as, as we saw before. So just for a simple connection with a, a small amount of data, we have uh, considering uh, time to, to, to wait. If we then want to do a, a, a new uh, 
request, but reusing the same connection will, will avoid the, all the part of the connection establishment. So with the, the, and, and the window size will be the last one that we used. So uh, in this case, with one round trip, we will be able to, to get the, the full data that we were asking. Uh, so I, I love the, the stats and, and taking real user uh, data. So this is from the Web Almanac. It's a, it's a report that uh, they do, the, the Web Archive organization uh, does uh, every year. Uh, and we can see here the, the time to first byte uh, that the users experiment in a 1,000 samples uh, that, that they have. Um, and they are uh, labeling as uh, fast the, the time to first byte that uh, take less than 200 milliseconds and as slow the, the ones that take more than one second. If we see the same but uh, grouped by, by website, we can see that only 2% of the websites are giving a fast time to first byte experience to more than 75% of the users. This is what, what we see here. Uh, and almost the half of the sample is giving a, a, a slow uh, time to first byte to the, to the users uh, to, to uh, 25 or more of the user experiences. Uh, so sometimes it's not the, the biggest part of the, of the request or the, the, this process that we are, we are seeing from the entering the URL to, the, to rendering the page, but it's, it takes a consider, considerable time. So going back, we, our network thread is going to, to get the URL that we, that we ask. Um, so the first thing that it needs to do is to understand and, and to verify that what the, the network is, is sending, what, 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 we, what we are receiving is actually HTML to, to show it in the, in the tab. Because as we know, the content type header the browser, the, the developers can put there anything and the browsers cannot trust in us. Uh, so they need to sniff the first bytes of the response to understand if it's uh, actually uh, an HTML file or not. If we see here, this is the code, uh, the, the Chromium code for, for this MIME sniffer. Uh, and they say here that this is a tricky business because they need to do a lot of things uh, to understand, to really understand what is the, the content that they are receiving. And if you check, this is a near 1,000 uh, lines of code file just to verify that the, the content type header is it's, uh, actually giving us what, what we ask. Um, so once we have the 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 net the, the, the network request the HTML uh, downloaded let's say the network thread will ask the uh, will let the the UI thread uh, know that uh, because the the UI thread will need to trigger or spin up a new renderer process the one that we say that is in charge of the content of the of the tab and here the renderer process will start doing all the things the, that, that it needs to, to actually render the page. Uh, and when it, uh, it finishes lo loading the, the HTML and all the assets that we have there, we'll uh, let the UI thread know that the page is finally loaded. We will go in, in a deep detail now in, in all the, that process. Um, but be, before that, uh, we need to understand what happens when, uh, when the user wants to visit a new site. Uh, if they, they, there are two different ways to navigate to a, to a different URL in this browser perspective. The first one uh, would be entering a new address in the, in the address bar. 
then the UI thread will need to ask the renderer process uh, if there's any code to run on the before and load uh, event. If that's the case, then the renderer process will run that code and after that, the UI thread will start all what we saw until now again, just for the new site. The second option to, to have a navigation to, to a different site would be clicking on a link on a on a on the website or doing a window dot location by, by JavaScript. Uh, in this case, the one that will know that the user is trying to navigate to a different site is the renderer process because this happens inside the 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 tab. Then the renderer process will run the before and load code if there is uh, any, and after that we'll let the UI thread know that the user wants to visit a, a new site. If the site is the same one, then the renderer process could be reused. If not, then the, the renderer process uh, or the, the UI thread will need to, to spin up uh, a new renderer process to handle the new site. In case of a service worker, uh, as you know, the service workers are kind of a proxy uh, in the uh, between the browser and, and the network. Uh, in this case, what, what happened is that the network, network thread will check if the domain that we are trying to, to visit uh, has uh, any service worker registered for the scope that we have. Uh, and in that case, what we will need a new renderer process just to run the code of the worker, because as you know, that's JavaScript code, then we need to run it in a renderer process. Uh, and what could happen in, in the service worker is that we can actually want to, to get that data from the network, then the worker thread will ask the network thread to go to, to the network again. So now talking specifically about the rendering process is kind of, of this, uh, we have uh, different steps for, for this process. The first one, when we receive the HTML, will be build the, the DOM tree. Uh, what happens here is that the, the browser receives the, the bytes of the response, will transform them into characters, will extract the tags from there, will create a node for each tag and will put that all that together into a into a tree uh, with with the shape of this DOM. For the CSS, what happens is something similar. We follow the same process, and we end up with a with a different tree, but with the styles for for each node. Uh, check that here in this span we have a display none because this is important for this step uh, where we build the render tree, we combine, or the browser uh, combines the DOM with the CSS, CSS on and builds a render tree. Um, but this render tree will on, only have the nodes that are actually present in the page. So this span that it's having a display none is, that is this one is disappearing from the render tree. The layout, paint, and composite is the whole process of actually painting the, the page. Uh, the layout phase will be the one in charge of defining the, the geometries, the sizes of the, of the elements, and, and where to put them. Then we will have the paint process that will be actually painting the, the pixels. And then we have the, the composite process that splits our 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 page into different layers so uh, what what happens for example when we do an scroll instead of painting the whole uh, the whole site again but a bit uh, more uh, for from to the side that we are scrolling uh, what it does is it composites again the layers that it has uh, and the only things uh, that that it needs to to do is to move the viewport, let's say, into that composition, and and that's uh, and a cheaper, uh, cheaper process, let's say. So, a quick example 
of this, we have this simple HTML with a, a, a style sheets uh, here linked with this shape. Uh, we start receiving the HTML, we start parsing it and building the, the DOM. Then we find this link here with these style sheets. So we need to go to the network and fetch the, the style sheets. Uh, but while we do that, we can continue parsing the HTML and uh, building the, the DOM. We parse the, we receive the, the CSS, we parse it and build the CSS on. And only after that, we will be able to build the render tree. But as you can see, until this moment, the page is still white because we don't have anything to, to show uh, before building the, the render tree. But we are missing something. I'm, I didn't talk about JavaScript, so let's add a JavaScript file to this HTML. Here, what, happened, what happens is some, it's a bit different. We were uh, parsing the, the HTML and building the DOM, but we found a, a JavaScript. So what the browsers need to do in this case is to fetch the file, parse it, execute it, and only after that, it will resume the HTML parsing, the DOM construction, and doing the, the CSS and CSS on. Um, this is kind of uh, the process because what the browsers actually do is like they try to to continue building the the DOM. The, the reason because they the reason why they stop is because they don't know if the JavaScript is going to modify the DOM or the HTML. So they need to wait until they execute the JavaScript to continue building the DOM. Uh, but what, what they actually do is they change to an expecul speculative mode. So they start, um, they continue parsing the HTML and building the, the DOM. And uh, if the JavaScript didn't modify any part of it, then they can continue from there. If not, they need to discard that all, all those changes and, and start again. So, bonus track of uh, of stats. Uh, as you can see, this is again from the same uh, report of, of the web archive. Uh, in median, our the, or the web has sites that that are more than one uh, one and one point five point point seven uh, megabytes. Uh, with uh, 360 kilobytes of JavaScript. Uh, but the part that it's a bit scary, scary is that 10% of the sites are bigger than six megabytes with more than one megabyte of, of JavaScript and 4.7 megabytes of images. So the web is weird, it's, it's complicated. Uh, and if we compare this with the previous year of, of the report, so 2018, we can see that we are growing everywhere. Uh, and in case of, of the median, the total size is near two kilobytes bigger than, than the previous year. And of course, we are shipping more JavaScript. That is something that I think we all uh, could expect. The, if, if we compare the desktop and mobile websites, uh, as you can see, the, the mobile websites, these ones, uh, have uh, a slightly smaller amount of JavaScript. Uh, but if we compare the time that they take to, to process that JavaScript, it's really bigger than the desktop uh, devices. Uh, so that's why uh, JavaScript is, is an expensive uh, resource, let's say. Uh, I don't know if we have time, but I wanted, I can do it very quickly. Um, I wanted, I have a, I had a victim, as I said at the beginning, I wanted to show here uh, what is happening when, when we render the page. As you can see, this page, well, now it's 21 megabytes because it has been open uh, during some times, but when you load it, it's around seven megabytes of, of data transfer. So it's a huge page. Uh, and we can check here that 
this before I'm, I had the, the page open and then I uh, refreshed the page and I recorded the timeline here. So the first thing that, that happened was the before and load method, as I showed you before. Then we started to receive the HTML. It's not a big HTML, but it has a lot of things uh, inside. It has, if we check here, it has uh, some uh, inline scripts and some big uh, style sheets. So if we check what is that happening here is we are running uh, the code, the, the JavaScript code. We pass the style sheets. And we recalculate the styles. Um, and only here we have the first paint. Uh, but after that, we continue parsing the, the HTML and the layout. This is because the page is changing a lot. Uh, it's showing the at the beginning, it doesn't have the cookies banner, then it had it. Um, but if you want to, to see all this process uh, from the browser uh, point of view, you can, you can check this performance tab here uh, and, and check it. This page shows how much this cost, uh, this site cost for, for a person. Uh, people in Mauritania, this is based on, on how expensive it is to, to have a, a megabyte of data uh, in, each of these countries. So here, if a person visits uh, this website that is uh, around seven megabytes, as I said before, uh, it, it, it will be spending more than 4% of the income for that day in that country. So this is why it's really important to be careful with the size of the page uh, because only just for visiting the homepage uh, they are spending 4% of the money that they earn that day. Uh, so it's complicated. Um, here you have the list of the link. This is a post that I said uh, before. This is the report that if you didn't read it, I really encourage you to, to check it. Uh, and some other posts and, and things. So that was very fast, but it was a lot of content. Uh, and that's all from my side. As I said, if you want to, to reach me out in Twitter, probably will be the, the best place to do it. Thank you, Leo. You're if welcome. you guys have any questions, you can put them on the chat or the Q&A feature. We will be passing on to Mateus. But we can go uh, back to the Leo presentation after that. Mateus, do you want to check your sharing screen mode? We are not hearing you. At least I'm not hearing you, Mateus. Sorry. Hello. Sorry. Oh. Hello. Ah, no. Now I can hear you. Okay. Now good. Okay. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Okay. Share. 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 For some reason. Uh, I, I'm not seeing the option to share screen. Oh, uh, it's on the menu on the bottom. If you move your mouse, maybe. Let me try to help you. There's a menu okay. on okay, the okay, bottom. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I find. Okay, let me open. Okay, uh, can you guys see my screen? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet, no. Okay. And now? Mm -mm. No. Nope. Okay. Ah, let's try. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
we're some, seeing uh, it. Some. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. not on on full screen, Let's so we're me. seeing the. Oh yeah, now it's it's full screen. Okay. Yeah. Now Thank it's you. Free. Yeah. Uh, there's some uh, hmm. problems to connect with my keynote. So sorry for that. No worries. So uh, good afternoon or good evening. Good afternoon, at least on my time zone. <laughs> so uh, the first thing, it's my first uh, talk on English. So sometimes I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but let's go. So uh, first, who am I? Uh, basically, my name is Matthews Monte, Mateus Monte, how do you prefer? Uh, now, now current I'm software engineer on Amazon Web Services. Uh, I'm former Samsung software engineer. I passed through some startups and uh, I read work for Nokia and Microsoft too. So this is my past. Uh, I'm an open source contributor and a community lover. Uh, main my experience, work experience is working with JavaScript and contributing with some open source projects. Uh, I'm currently living in Dublin, but don't know where the, the future will be. And uh, my mood is always travel, live code and repeat. This is my main philosophy. So uh, today we are talking a little uh, a little about folder organizations and files uh, on React project. It's something that that we are not paying uh, a lot of attention until this is a uh, very difficult to maintain. So uh, on my past experiences, I have uh, a lot of problems doing this and uh, this talk it's a personal view to share uh, about this topic. So it, this is not a, a rule, this is not a uh, partner, this is just uh, some knowledge and sharing about my previous experiences using React and uh, the projects that escalated. So feel free to disagree or feel free to suggest some changes. So uh, before I start, uh, some details that we have to have on mind. The first one is React is a leap and not a framework. So what this means? Means that uh, if you are using a lib, it's not something that, that has a lot of rules defined how to use. It's like, for example, you are programming on C language, you have a, a lib that you can import and use it whatever you can. So it's the, the same philosophy is applied to React. If you read the, the React documentation, they put uh, too much clear on the title that React is a lib, so you can use it however you want. Uh, I already see React be used uh, inside uh, another frameworks or, or in to build the entire something with vanilla JavaScript. And we have uh, until with different uh, handlers on browsers or and mobile, we have a, a vast, a vast uh, greenfield to React. So, uh, the second point, this is a focus on V from MVC. So uh, this is a view lib. So we are here to build views. Uh, so this will be provide us some tools to build uh, views interfaces to user, but we have to organization these in a better way to, to work conjointly with another frameworks or with uh, another kinds of project. And uh, because our thesis is flexible to our users. So I'm not here to say you are, you are using React in the wrong way because there is no wrong way. Uh, there is no right way. In the same time, there is no wrong way. So you can use React as the best for your user case. But these, uh, we can see some uh, logic organizations that we can uh, put inside a React project. So, uh, React project journey. I think uh, at the least 9% for 19% for all the projects start with create React app and a new project name. Uh, at the least uh, on my side, all the projects that I started with on this way. Uh, and these have a, a good thing. The good thing is 
we just need one file. So all your, when I say one file, I'm saying basically where you put your code, your logic, and this will reflect on UI. Uh, I know there is a, a lot of another files involved in that when you created a, a app using create hack app, they created a, a package, created a bundle, created a lot of things. But if you think about how many files you need to created something with this uh, bootstrap project, basically you just need one file. App.js is describing all the application at this moment. So you, you, we, we have all the text, we have all the image, we have all the interactions defined by just one file. And this is good because it is the easy to start and the easy, easy to deploy something, it's easy to put something online it's so fast you you can create it all the changes that you want but uh, the things get complicated when your application is growing so when you start growing your application or you start to have another engineers uh, working on your application the things start coming to be more complicated uh, on this on this part I have a, a, a good example on the past uh, I, I was allocated on a project that it's already started and uh, it's a website with uh, at least four or five sections and the, all the sections are just described and developed inside the, the app.js. So you can imagine the, the file, the file size and the, how many code lines we have. So on this project specifically was the first time that I think, oh, how I can create a structure that escalated with my application. So I started looking on the internet. I, I, I look on the official documentation. I look on some uh, Stack Overflow. I look on some mediums post and uh, I just find one answer for that. And the answer is move the things around until it looks right. This is the main code on the internet when you looking for React uh, folder or files structure. The, the main answer that we give is move the things around until look right. Okay, this is good because it still us have a flexibility to, to use in the better way for our projects. But sometimes we need to discuss some points and we need to create it a, a good way. So. My first question when I read that is, okay, how can I move the things around and uh, try to get a better project structure to my application? And uh, we, we spend a lot of uh, engineering meetings and all with uh, good senior developers to find the better way to reorganize this project. And uh, based on that, uh, I, I decided to create this this uh, talk, but I have a disclaimer. Any code or any situation uh, present on this talk is not related to any code on production or any code that was deployed or developed for previous or current uh, companies. Uh, just a, a legal disclaimer my lawyer advised me to do. <laughs> uh, so let's try to order the calls. So it's it's a, a different uh, it's a it's difficult to to talk to you. Oh, you have to do that. So uh, it's completely crazy because every project can be a different situation. On this situation that we are uh, imagining, uh, basically we have three points that have uh, to be considering. The first one is oh sorry. The first one is uh, we want to move things in one direction. So when we start a project with create a hack tap and this, pro this project starts growing, you have to, to think which steps do you, you follow to escalate this code. Today, uh, it's so easy to escalate uh, a web application uh, because we have cloud platforms that just provided a new fleet with one click 
and we can escalate that. But when I say escalated uh, application, we are talking about the code because the code is something that, that is your application. So you need uh, something called develop experience because the develop experience is something so high, important to the, to the productive. If you have a bad code experience to your engineers, you are less, you are lost in money because you are be more, less productive. So when you improve the code experience for your engineering, uh, you are improving your productive and you are gaining more money because of that. So the, the idea is created here, a timeline that we can find to a, a better way to grow your code using the grow your project and your, your complexity. So uh, I already talked about the second point is created the timeline and to evolve your code base based on your project needs. Uh, the idea key is not to say, hey, you have to create this super complex uh, structure on your first commit is not the idea. The idea is have some phases that you will follow your project complexity to create a better uh, developer experience. You can choose a partner that fits in your team. This is just a, some templates. So this is not a rule. I'm not creating a, a new thing, a big thing. I'm just in giving you some templates about how to organize your, your project. So uh, let's consider that you started uh, with the app.js and the, the first thing that you have to, we must have to create, to separate the codes, is separated on, on var in, in many .js files. So the, the, the first idea is separate by context, uh, which kind of context do you have in your project? For example, uh, on this picture that we have here, we have a very simple example when we have a button.js and a app.js. On this idea is, is start to separate the things from app.js and remain with app.js just as a, a handler thing. For example, on, a, on this project that we have a very, uh, a very, high, a very huge uh, website just, uh, just developed inside app.js, the first thing was take over from, from this, this app.js, the, these parts. So we have five parts and we take over from this and created five uh, .js files. It's not the, the best thing, but helps a lot to, to start giving maintenance on this code. So because it's still simple, it's so, so easy to see the, the, the structure and they know where you have to change the things or when you put the new things. It's better to divide your codes on sections. For example, imagine you have a hot page that have a product presentation, uh, a map, and a contact. We can create three separate files and give the app.js just to render that. So it's, it's easy to split your code on some sections. On this context, component, components means uh, visual and logic implementation. When I say components, I say, for example, uh, on, this, on this case that I say, uh, a map. Imagine that we ha have a section in your hot page that is a map. You have not just created the map component, you have to create it to get all the data and put everything in just one file. And uh, this, is, this is a simple structure that, uh, at least in my experience, I can recommend to you to use on POCs, in proof of concepts, or small one page websites because it's something simple. It's easy to an, another engineer contribute to you, and uh, but it's not the, the the better way to create a huge application. For example, if you are thinking about creating a system uh, or something more complex, I really don't advise you to use this structure. Just to uh, I needed to create a proof of concepts that React works with uh, my new project. Okay, it's a it's a good way to separate it, but in the future probably probably you need to give it one more step. And the next step on that, it's what I call it phase two. Uh, this phase is about to separate your components on different files. Uh, and the, what we have here, we have, for example, uh, 
when we start having testings for your components, when you, you need a separate CSS file, when you need to create some YouTube files, it's a good idea to move uh, these components inside a folder. As you can see on the second picture, uh, we have the SRC folder and the inside of that we have the button folder that have three files that describe my component button. And it, on this stage, AppJS is still doing the rendering or, or what means that it, it, they import these files and render to, to the user. So it's a little more complicated, but it's a good to small projects that not don't have uh, that have data handle because you can start separated your components in an isolated uh, thing and you can add more more uh, complexity on this. You don't have, uh, for example, if you still with phase one and you, you add uh, tests, for example, to your component, you, you have at least one more file with the same name for the same component and we still have a, a, a long list of file inside one, just one folder. So this is approach good recommended to a small project with some data to handle, but not too large, because if you have too large, you will still have the same problems on, on, the, on the initial, the initial uh, phase, that is your app.js will be too high with a lot of importance and a lot of things will be handled inside that. So if you, your project is small and they start uh, growing, you can, you can ask me, okay, uh, I have the problem on the app.js because app.js now it's so, it's, so, it's so huge because there is a lot of importation because at least in this phase two, we are creating a, a, a subset of, of uh, folders and the, the app.js is the main handler, so they are important that and put on the app.js. So you are giving a, a very high app.js and very complex file. A good idea is create it's created type folders. It's some denomination to to it's a high level folder that have a, another folders inside that that describe a minor part, but they have domains. Or, or what this means means that each high level folder uh, have a, a different uh, responsibility. For example. Uh, on this example, we have components, containers, data, hooks, and the, the, the app.js. The app.js is still because they are, they, he is the, it is the, the, the entry point for our application. Uh, but you can see now we have containers and we have components. This is a, a, a name that I put on that. You, you prefer to change if you want. Uh, basically, components are folders that com contains uh, files to describe components, and the containers are uh, views, are user views that use these components to mount and create the user experience, the user UI, the user interface. So, for example, we can see here we have containers that have login, and inside login we have some files. These files are responsible to use the components that are on the component site, and we can import in the better way that we think. And the app.js just will import the first, uh, the first view from your system. So the idea here is uh, reduce your app.js and uh, separate that in a, a lot of uh, responsibility views. And the first one that is the, the main page of your system or your website, will be just the one that the app.js will import and handle. We have another separate folders here that I put as an example, for example, data. It's a, imagine that it's a file that to handle with API requests or third party integrations. And we have a, a hooks. It's a, a common thing, it separate hooks from the components. It's a philosophy thing we can discuss uh, a lot of that if it hooks it be part of a component or hooks can be a separate, a separate thing. We can discuss that. Uh, but here it's, a, it's something very affordable. It's something that you can create a huge system because 
at the least you can stay uh, your files always uh, always uh, a small part of your system. You don't need to create a very huge uh, files. This, this uh, folder organizations fits well with middle and high complex projects because we can separate it or we can create it, uh, another high level type folders and uh, feel free to create it by your need. And uh, at least here, we can separate the logic from the components because the idea of the component is something that be high reusable. For example, a button don't need, don't need to handle data to create some user uh, experience, but this is responsible from the containers. So the containers is the domain that get data to create, for example, a list item. I need to populate a list item. The container will be responsible to get this from the APIs, uh, parse this data, and the, uh, to send that to the component to handle this list. But the same component can be reused in the another container. Is the, the 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 basically what the web component is about? It's reuse code. But on this approach, we find uh another problem it's if your view have a lot of iterations if your container have a, a very very huge uh steps to complete it for example let's see on um, imagine that you have a payment uh payment view that it, you have a card registration a payment confirmment a checkout and the, a lot of operations that you need to complete on this uh, container on this view, you have a problem because this file is still too high, uh, too huge. So you have a, a, a lot of amount of things. We have a lot of uh, uh, HTML. So you can go and it was something that we call it the phase four is to create it, uh, domains inside the containers. So basically uh, I, I put an example here, the payments. Uh, imagine that you have payments uh, uh, operational called the card registration and another one called the cal, uh, payment confirmation. This two is part of payment, but they have a, a lot of uh, implementations and validations. So they need to be separated on files to reduce the complexity uh, of the, the file. And then you can create it as subdomains uh, inside the the, the container folder or another things. Sometimes uh, you you have some, at the least uh, uh, in the last project that I work, at the least four uh, files on each, uh, which, which uh, folder of that. Of course, you can reduce that to using, for example, CSS in JS or another techniques, but it's uh, something that you have to, to accord with your team. Uh, you can add this uh, to any another high level type folder. For example, if uh, your data uh, access is, is, is became uh, a lot of uh, complex, you can apply the same, the same approach to divide that on, on some, on, on some subfolders. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, this is just a suggestion. Uh, I want to relate it to you uh, as community. Uh, my previous experience to escalated uh, React uh, application. Probably this is uh, something very common for the guys that are already working on big platforms or big projects. Uh, someone already defined that before you, but at the least when you are a beginner on the technology, I think this is a very, very interesting topic because you have to think about this kind of thing to escalate it or create it something that will be bigger. Uh, uh, I basically, I, I have here some templates that we can use. Uh, it's so hard to me to find something like that on internet. So feel free to use and uh, change in the better way for you. Uh, as I say on this slide, this is just a suggestion for you. It's something just to think about and they describe my experience escalating uh, React application. Is it? Uh, if you want to get, uh, I, I tried to, to do this 
uh, short as possible because I know after the work we are tired. So if you want to get in touch, there is two much more uh, reasons that we have, to, we take some decisions. So feel free to ping me on Twitter or if you prefer to send me an email. I love to discuss about project structure. It's something that I really like to, to, to change ideas with the people. If you have some questions, please feel free. Thank you, Mateus, for your presentation. Thanks for being here and congrats on your first presentation in English. It was just fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you, there's any questions, please go ahead. We are recording this session and we recorded the previous one because we are planning on a YouTube channel. I know it's, we are late on that project because uh, quarantine comes in and it's hard but it's something that we want to work on. So the um, previous meetup and this meetup will uh, be, um, will be uh, on that YouTube channel when we have it, okay? Thank okay. you all. Uh, Mateus, you can stop your screen share yeah, yeah. if you want. Okay, thank uh you. Thank you. Well, thanks for those who came. And if you have any question regarding this meetup or whatever, anything else, or if you have any idea for the next meetup in, that we want to present in July, please get in touch with us via Slack, Twitter, uh, or the meetup website directly. And thank you all the panelists and thank you all the attendees. Anything else? No? Okay. Bye. Enjoy your time and your weekend coming in. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.